bombardier, James uh, Felton, and you were serving with, is, was it pronounced 178 Field Regiment? Yeah. Yeah, of, uh, part of 36 Division, HQ2 Division, yeah, part of the 30, 366 Field Battery. 366 Field Battery, brilliant. Light, light Battery, 366 Light Battery, I should say. Light it's Battery. Quite, it's it's uh, very unusual, is that? Tell me first of all a little bit about um, your background. Where were, where were you born, James? Oh, I'm a Lancashire man, born actually in church, and that's a small town, uh, but I wasn't there very long. Um, my parents moved into Oswaldfussel, and uh, that's where I stayed then until I joined the army. Um, you know, all my upbringing and childhood memories, school days, they're all from uh, Oswaldfussel. And around that area, because of uh, course... That's the place... Uh, Near, near Blackburn, between Oswald is between Blackburn and Accrington. And of course, if we think of World War One, we think of the Accrington Pals, of course, a very famous story well, as well. We should, yes, because uh, I had uh, my uncle, and I had an uncle in, in the Accrington Pals, and of course my father, he was in the First World War, but as I say, because of his age, he didn't, he never got into action. He got as far as training, and he was training in North Wales. I can't remember just how much service he'd done or training, but it was up until that time. And then, of course, the war, the First World War ended, which meant that he was lucky enough not to have to uh, go into action. Your own service, you had your primary training, or basic training as it's now called. Tell us about that. Where did, where did you do your primary training? I did the primary training in Carlisle. The, the, the primary training is, is uh, to get you accustomed to army life, really. Being shouted at. You read the rules and regulations of army life so that you're not to cross them. And uh, it's an initiation and it lasted six weeks. And during that period, you learn all about the drill, the ranks of the various officers, and uh, the, the do's and don'ts in the army, as it were. And you get really used to uh, army life. After this particular training, then you are assessed for what uh, might be the best service that you can be placed in. Uh, how it, it came about was I was just chosen as the army. I, I didn't choose. When my call-up papers came, uh, they were uh, assigned to the army, so I didn't have any choice whether I was army, air force or navy. <clears throat> but uh, from Carlisle then, after the uh, uh, initial training, it was uh, decided that I would uh, be sent for training with the Royal Artillery as a gunner. And this was uh, after the six weeks. And that was way further north from Carlisle up to Edinburgh. So I spent about six months in Edinburgh training as a gunner. But during that period, I did lots of things. I finished up actually uh, recommended as a signaller because uh, I, I learned the Morse code, and uh, which is, of course, people <laughs> wouldn't understand today because that's long since disappeared. But uh, operating wireless radios and also the telephone exchange. But uh, also, when you get these separate jobs, you could also be a gunner, and you have to be able to fire the gun or actually operate with other people, other gunners on the gun itself and uh, we were on 25 pounders in uh, Edinburgh <clears throat> now that's a very common gun for the Royal Artillery a, f a field gun and then uh, I, 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 the position I got was number three on the gun number three is the, is the chappy that lays has to lay the gun now the word laying the gun means that you have to sort it all out, get it level, and you have to position it to actually fire. And when all this is done, you actually pull a rope or, or pull the handle and fire the shell. And that's the uh, operation of number three. But there are six people to the 25 pounder. But um, I, 
getting along too quickly from that because uh, we went into action, first of all, with these £25 or so when we moved abroad. But these were taken off us and we suddenly changed. And we were given what was called, the, uh, classified by many people, as a screw gun. And the, the screw gun is the one, it's a mountain gun, it's the smallest field gun in the artillery. But it takes more men because it can be pulled to pieces and carried. Each man can, one man can carry one wheel, one another, and the barrel itself comes into two pieces, it unscrews, and that's why they called it the screw gun. In fact, if you like to look up Kipling's poetic history, you'll find that he has written a poem about the screw gun. So I guess that's a bit like we used to see the field gun race happening as part of the Royal Tournament with the gun being stripped down, taken across fences, reassembled, it was that kind of thing, was it? That, that was the case, yes, but fortunately, I never saw it stripped down. We went into action with it. it I think it, it was stripped down when they flew, they were flown into Burma, because that was the only way they could get the guns into Burma. But uh, I'd, uh, I wasn't actually working on the gun then, I was more operating as a signaller. Therefore, I never really got the chance to actually pull them to pieces and put it together. And in fact, that was very rarely done. And I don't even remember it actually being done, even though we took it up mountains. And, and that's the reason for it, because you can carry it up a mountain quite easily if you've got it stripped down into six, six or eight, uh, tw uh, eight pieces. So you were acting uh, largely as a signaller, a scaly back as they would have been called at the time. You were carrying a fair amount of weight then, I'm guessing. Pardon? You were carrying a fair amount of weight on your back then with the equipment. Well, there's another good thing, because with the artillery in Burma in that case, no, we had no problems, because of course you had to have a, a what they call it was a quad to actually tow the gun. I mean, we didn't pull. We didn't pull the gun personally, so it was necessarily to have transport. And because there was transport, then there was a, another small vehicle attached to the gun called a limber. Now the limber is the one that carries the ammunition. Now once you've got all these together, of course, you've got to get the gunners. So uh, they had a quad, what was named a quad. This is an RA vehicle where the gunners actually transported. Um, with the with the gun, and that will sometimes tow the gun. So you've got the gunners in the quad with the gun behind you and the ammunition behind that. So it was uh, quite a trail, really. It's a big logistical thing. Let's take you back. How did you get to Burma? Did uh, you go by ship, presumably? Yes, that's an interesting story because it was a long, long journey. Of course, when. Uh, uh, the time that I was actually drafted into the army was at the time just as the Japanese started to uh, uh, invade places. And uh, it was uh, 1942. Now the Japanese had already started uh, raising hell in the Pacific. And uh, of course, w when it came time for uh, us to go into action, when you're ready to go, you don't know where you're going. You all say, we're going to, we're going to go off now to get a, to a, a unit, which of course, you don't know where the unit's going, and so much secrecy, you didn't know anything at all about it. And there was all sorts of uh, guesses and uh, remarks about people, where we were going and what we were going to do. And it wasn't until we were on the boat leaving Liverpool that we actually found out we were off to India and Burma. And what was your thought at that stage? How much did you know about where you were going to? Uh, what do you mean, geographically? Geographically, but also about the action that was going to be happening there. Oh, well, we, the, the, yes, because the Japanese were raising hell, weren't they, out there? And we knew that uh, we were going to have to tackle them. We didn't know what part of the area in the Pacific we were going to, of course, and then, but the reason, first of all, was you have to get to India, and because it's a different climate altogether, you had the training then to get accustomed to the actual climate. 
the jungle. They've got all your uniform has changed. I mean, sweating out in the sun and learning all the problems about jungle warfare and the fact of disease and problems like that. We had to be very aware of uh, cholera and uh, insect bites. Malaria was another thing. And we were taking tablets to fight malaria, uh, even in India, before we went off to Burma. When uh, we finished our training in Burma, uh, in Burma, uh, in India, uh, this was in Pune, where we where we'd been training. Now Pune is on the uh, west side of India. Therefore, we had all the way across India to go. And we went across India by train, all the way up to Kolkata. It took us quite a few days traveling by train on the Indian Railway. We changed many drivers and, uh, on the way. And of course, we had lots of stops for various reasons. It took us quite a few days. But once we got there into Burma, then our next occupation was we decided they were sending us into Arakan because the Japanese at that time had decided to make attacks on the Arakan area. So what were your first impressions? We talked about the heat, we talked about the insects, we, we talked about on malaria and things like that. Also the equipment, the way you presumably you look after the equipment is vastly different in the jungle to how it would be if you were fighting in Europe. Well, the, the, of course, the one thing that's completely different, mosquito nets, because you couldn't, uh, uh, during the period when mosquitoes were very lively, you had to put up your mosquito net. And there were regulations. After sundown, you were not allowed to wear shorts, or uh, you, you had to roll your sleeves down, because the, mos uh, the mosquitoes were terrible at about that time at the night, when they were very active. and. Uh, this was always a regulation. You had to be careful about certain things like that. But also, you had to worry about the insects. And two of the most serious ones, of course, or brands, were uh, snakes and scorpions. And you have to watch out because they get into your boots at night and do well, all sorts of things. Yeah, that was <laughs> the first thing you did when you got up in the morning, if you'd survived the night. <laughs> you got hold of your boot, turned it upside down, and give it a good shake, just to make sure there's no foreign mess in it. <laughs> so for a boy from Lancashire, suddenly arriving into the midst, let alone the fighting, and we'll come to that, but just surviving and being in that environment must have been very different for you. Well, it, it was because I saw you, you, you were with a new band of fellows, but you soon got uh, accustomed to them, friendly with them, and obviously picked out the best friends that you were near, but that mainly, uh, was due to the fact of what position you were in, in the battery because if each battery had different groups doing different jobs therefore you would have uh, some mates that were m more close to you all the time you got to know everyone in the battery the whole people, sergeant and sergeant major and everybody but if the, uh, the, the actual part of the, the battery that you were in service with, of course you became very friendly, even though you were friendly with all, all of them, really. But it's a, it's, a, it's a second family, isn't it, when you're that close to people, I guess? Yes, yes. So you were you there, you arrived in Burma, you are set up. What was the action like? Were the Japanese shelling you regularly? Was it living with that all the time? That was the, uh, the biggest problem. We were shelled every night without fail. And uh, you could be sure. We used to set, oh, come on, say, set your watch. We used to set our watches almost because I don't know why it was the favorite time. Maybe uh, it's because of the actual areas that we were in the jungle. But the Japanese always used to, they used to shell us through the day, but not as much as they did at night. And I think that was what they call nuisance shelling. We used to call it nuisance shelling too because we used to do the same thing. As long as you're shelling people throughout the night, they're not going to get much sleep, are they? <laughs> so it breaks them down in sort of, uh, the, sort of the, the resistance and everything yes. else. 
outside of the, the action itself, what were the living conditions like for you and your oppos? Uh, well, in Burma uh, or in camp? In, in camp, when you were in camp and you were back and they were well, time. Well, in camp it, it wasn't too bad. That was, and first of all, Carlisle and uh, Edinburgh, I was sending reports home to my mother. I said, oh, you know, I've got some lovely rice pudding today, but it wasn't quite as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> Keep mum sweet, that's yeah. important. <laughs> Did you have anything in the way of entertainment? Did Ensa? Uh, the, the entertainment, the live entertainment, come as far as Burma or not? Well, it did, but well, I, never, well, I never saw any of it. Be, um, because um, there was uh, a few people went out there entertaining. Uh, there, what, what, there was one chappy I saw, what was his name there? Uh, a singer, an entertainer? He was a radio, uh, oh, okay. a radio fan. Okay. And, but so you had yeah, some. I, I'm, I'm too old to actually remember now. But it's a while ago. Every, he, he's the only one. Every night came, something awful, wasn't came it? Was near a... our un... He's the only one that came sure. near our unit. Although there was a beer of Lynn and other places. Traveling but she never came to our, our unit. Absolutely. She, she, uh, there's apparently, she told me a very interesting story a few years ago, before she died, obviously, about uh, being in the jungle. And she left a picture in one of the camps and many many years later some other people came across that picture was still stapled to a tree or pinned to a tree in the burma jungle oh. incredible she was very impressed by that um, moving on from the entertainment the 14th army of which you were part were led by general sir william slim what were your thoughts on him as a leader oh he was brilliant and uh, we, we we seemed to do have good progress on the slim but uh, my other general, was in, the one in charge of the division that I was in, was uh, Major General Festings. And uh, he was a, a wartime soldier or a permanent soldier. I think his family were soldiers as well, uh, going dating back many years. You mentioned a few moments ago the letters home to your mum about the rice pudding. Am I, did I understand it right that you wrote letters from your first day in the army all the way through until your very last day in the army, is that correct? I did, from the very first day. And uh, they, uh, as a result of that, but when I sent them home, my, my father, he was quite astute really, and he had a bit of education and he, uh, he was quite sensible. And he said uh, that he was, Saving all, he said to me on, in the letter, sending it home after I'd sent a few, I'm saving all your letters so that you'll be able to read them and reminisce afterwards when you get back home. Now, and I, I thought very little about that. I knew he'd done that and saved the letters. When my parents died, they both died at the same year, actually, 880. And... Uh, <coughs> When I was clearing out the place, I came across the letters. I'd forgotten, I'd never even thought about them since because I had uh, moved on and I was living in London, not in Lancashire. And I used to visit them, but of course, uh, not being in touch every day, those everyday things were missed. And uh, I never realised about the letters, although I guessed he must have had them somewhere. And when I found them, Every letter had been pin pushed through a little hole in the corner on a long string, and the long string was about 12 inches long. <laughs> so 40 years on from when you wrote them in 1980, you had the chance to reread them again. What were your thoughts when you read the letters you'd written all those years before? Uh, when I did that, because I said my parents had died, I came across the letters amongst other things, and I started to read them. And I thought, oh yeah, I like it. My father had said, you'll be interested to read these when you later on. And when I started to read them, uh, I had a good memory about the war at that particular time. But when I started to read them, they became so interesting to me. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to write these out. What I did, I started to edit them. By that, I mean, there were so many things in the letters about family matters. You know, somebody getting married, or somebody having a baby, or uh, who was doing what, where, and everything. So, as I started to edit the letters, 
all the actual personal details that were of little value to anyone else, I just left them out. But I started to write up this story of my life actually in Burma. And it transpired that uh, of these, I finished up with uh, 440 letters that actually produced, was a prediction of a, a book which I later sent away and, and it, I did have it uh, uh, approved and it was printed. It was called The Forgotten Army. What did it mean to you to sort of all those years later when you finally saw a copy of the book and know that your experiences were out there for others to read? What did that mean to you? Uh, it was uh, amazing. Uh, the, the interesting thing, that I think, slightly different probably to many other books, the fact that I'm an artist. Uh, in fact, I trained as an artist. And that's how I went from art school into the army. So whilst I was in, throughout the war, I was painting whenever I could. Uh, I preferred watercolour painting because it's the oil painting wouldn't have been very satisfactory moving about in the jungle. You could just start something and someone would say, come on, well, the Japanese have retreated, we're moving. So you'd have to pack everything up immediately. And having a watercolour and also it was much easier. You could just get the paints set it sorted out and make take the pictures. And uh, so I did quite a lot of sketching. And uh, it was the results of these that were actually uh, illustrated the book that I had. We'll come back to that artwork in a second. Those original letters of yours are now stored as part of the Royal Artillery Museum at Lark Hill on Salisbury Plain. What does that mean to, to you to know that those letters are still being used for reference and research? Well, that's inter very interesting to me because uh, I don't, I, they probably have other bits of material, but what they have there, they have an artillery man's history from the very first day he joined the army to the very last. Now, if you think about this, I, I must have been writing, uh, uh, these letters must have been about at least two a week, often three, because apart from the letters that I'm sending here, I was writing other letters. Uh, there was a fairly large, my mother had a large family, sisters and brothers, and I was writing to, to all these people as well. So the amount of letters, it was actually 440 recorded in the book, but I think there must have been what, one and a half times as much again as that. Wow, uh, out there. You touched on the artwork, you touched on the paintings, watercolours as opposed to oil, but photography became a thing for you as well. I'm just envisaging this. Tell us, you're in Burma, you're in these austere conditions fighting a war, but you managed to, to start processing and printing your own photos, didn't you? Well, uh, there was a regulation in, when you're in action, or they were during this war anyway, and I think it was also applied to the First World War. <clears throat> you were not allowed to take a camera into the front line. This was in case you were overrun by the enemy and they had proof of uh, many of the secrets that uh, they could find out from the details of the photographs. So it was the same in Burma. And I was only dependent on the sketches I was doing and sending home. And as the Japanese were being, uh, you know, evacuated, routed from Burma, and they were moving down from North Burma down to Rangoon, time went on and they were being expelled. Um, news came around and said, oh, if anyone has a camera, yeah, we'll allow you to use it now. So immediately I wrote off and said, uh, look, send out the camera. But I'd been using a plate camera. This is one of the more difficult types of cameras to use in warfare, really. To use a roll film camera is a much easier and simpler job. You just put the film in and take when the pictures. About, when we talk about plate, that's glass plates, isn't it? Which presumably could shatter and break and... Oh, the, yes, they were. They, uh, they, it was a, a plate, uh, a plate, what is known as a plate camera. To, the size of the plates two and a half inches and three and a half inches. So they sent me out the material, the camera, which I still have to this day. And uh, they sent me some negatives, they're old glass negatives. 
yet it was difficult to get hold of film negatives for the actual play, uh, for the camera. But uh, one of the other things was, if you had these out there, what was uh, going to be the results? So they also sent me out chemicals because I'd also been processing uh, chemicals before I was interested in photography, having been interested in photography. And my father had taught me a lot because he was an amateur photographer. He'd won one or two prizes in local exhibitions and things. <clears throat> and uh, I learnt that from a very early age all the interesting features of uh, developing and printing from uh, cameras at that time because uh, I mean, the Leica was only just sort of coming up and they were very expensive, films of that, uh, cameras of that nature, so and roll film cameras too, um, were, um, they, they were quite popular, the roll film camera, but the plate camera is distinct because you can really get an accurate picture and you can focus it to the actual finest details or, uh, or operate it much, much better. So that was an advantage, but... Uh, what did your oppos, what did your comrades think of you doing these, these paintings and the photos and everything else? Sorry? What did your oppos think, what did the people you were working with, your comrades, make of everything you were doing with the photos and the art? Oh, they didn't take much notice, really. <laughs> and I don't think they understood the whole situation, really. Um, but uh, when it, the, the big problem was, that I wanted to know how the actual photographs were going. And as soon as the camera came out and they sent me some chemicals, <coughs> now to actually process the chemicals, how was I going to do that? Actually, there were the, the, in, in Burma, when you are fighting with a unit, with the type of uh, the artillery unit I was, even infantry people, they, you always have a two-man slit trench guarding the, guarding the whole area. So I was in a, a two-man slit trench with another man. Now when I needed to develop the prints, I would go to tarpaulin and put it over the top of the slit trench and develop the prints in, inside the, the actual slit trench. All those slit trench, all the negatives were processed in the dark under uh, a tarpaulin in the Burma jungle. So no red light, you couldn't see what you were doing, and also presumably trying to keep the temperature of the chemicals steady must have been oh, difficult. Oh, that was terrible. It was necessary to use a thermometer, and uh, it, what, that was a big problem because the slightest variation in temperature can vary the length of development and the, how, how it's being exposed, and you had to be very careful not to make get any light in. <clears throat> if I want to uh, talk about one occasion, when uh, I'd had t taken some negative, I could only, the, the, the plates for the camera would only hold six negatives. So that was the limit. Why the Isle of Man in the end? <laughs> well, the, because of my, I'd amassed this large collection of historic material and a lot of friends of mine who were collecting this type of, of, of material, they were just specialising in certain items. One might just be roll film cameras, another might be images, uh, certain types of images, and uh, magic lanterns, lantern slides. But I was collecting everything because I was, you know, so interested in the whole history. And uh, I had been doing lectures around the place. I'd even been abroad lecturing, and I went to America lecturing on the history of photography uh, to George Eastman House, which is the home of Kodak. <coughs> and uh, but, uh, how it came to be that, that I finally did find somewhere, my wife uh, was, uh, I was, this was in, in Kingston where I, I live. My wife said, I'm just going to pop out doing some shopping. So I said, okay, off you go. So <laughs> she disappeared shopping. I don't know what I was doing at the time, but uh, but she came back in. And when she came back in, I just said to her, Lillian, I said, you must sit down. She said, well, what for? I said, well, sit down. I said, I've booked a holiday. 
<laughs> I'd been studying the paper while she was out shopping and I'd seen this advertisement for a holiday place in the Isle of Man. I was very familiar with the Isle of Man, but I'd never been. So I thought, this sounds interesting. But I hadn't the faintest hope or thought about a, a museum. So obviously I booked this holiday, came over, and the minute I came over, I, or by car of course, I was driving the car, and stayed at this place, driving out, I drove down to Port Heron. <coughs> and in Port Heron, there was a huge shop that has, was actually a jeweler's shop with a comoda with uh, souvenirs as well and another apart. And when I looked at this, it for sale, it said on the notice. So I thought I'd make some inquiries. I said, Lillian, look, that place, that would make a museum. So I'd make some inquiries. And as the phrase goes, to cut a long story short, I just said, went ahead and made all sorts of details, made inquiries with the government about opening a museum, because at that particular time, uh, you, you couldn't come over and do a job that a maximum could do. Uh, if it was a professional job, like a doctor or a, a curate or a dentist or something of that nature, then you could get, get permission. But otherwise, if you were going to take the occupation away from a manxman, you couldn't, you couldn't come over. So I just made inquiries. So oh, yes, you can come and open the museum. So off, I said, right, this is it. Made inquiries about the place and started negotiations then to buy it. And off we, over we came. And you, we, I think this was in 77. We were over in the next year. So you didn't mess around with that one. Huge year for you last year, your 100th birthday. And you did that. There was a party for you at Government House, wasn't there? What was that like? Oh, that was it, 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 that was strange because I knew that somebody was arranging a birthday for me due to the Burma Star Association, which has been uh, uh, it was closing down at that time. Anyway, the actual Burma Star itself. But all my friends, uh, we regularly had meetings. And as my birthday was coming along, a, a very good friend of mine, living up in Onken, uh, said, look, we're arranging a party and you can come up to my place and uh, we'll have a party at my house. Now, this was all a facade as far as I could make out, because in the end, they must have got in touch with the governor, told the governor that I was 100, and instead of going into this private house with the large garden, uh, we stopped at the, someone, uh, we were driving up and you had to go past the governor's house to get to this place at Honkham. And we stopped and the, the person who was taking me up there said, oh, wait a minute, I've got to call in here. I said, oh, all right. So I sat in the car and then they came out and the governor came out. <laughs> Goodness, the party was here, not, not in the house, uh, but in government house. <laughs> what a lovely way to spend a hundredth birthday. You're a member of the Burma Star Association, uh, now known as the Burma Star Memorial Fund. Does that go any way toward making up for the Burma veterans being, for so long, effectively the forgotten army? Well, it's always been understood and it's continued to be understood because uh, there's so much about the European war that was reported and not the Burma the war in Burma. Now, my brother, he was actually fighting in Europe. He was landed on D-Day. He was a, a veteran landing on D-Day on the beach, one of the first landings. And unfortunately, he was wounded on, on the beach on that particular landing. He, he didn't spend much half the day in there, I think, before he was evacuated. But apart from that, <clears throat> I was writing to him, as many other people, <coughs> and then when the actual decision for the end of the European war, when Hitler and everything else was, uh, uh, the Germans decided to capitulate, then uh, my brother wrote to me, he said, oh look, he said, there's all sorts of celebrations going on round here, he says, but nobody's thinking about you out there, and uh, he actually wrote that in a letter. That must have really brought it home to you mm. as well at that stage. Because we were still fighting. 
and that went on for a long time and could have gone on yeah. for a lot longer. Well, I don't know about a lot. It was at least two months anyway. And as I say, if it hadn't been for the atomic bomb, it would have gone on longer. Last year, after celebrating your 100th birthday, you represented Burma veterans at the Cenotaph in London at yeah. Remembrance Parade. What was that like to do? That was very interesting. But of course, <clears throat> I was going to say being a Londoner, but I'm not a Londoner, I'm from Lancashire. But as I finished up my days in the army, then I, was, uh, I went to London because of the reasons for the jobs that I was going to do as a designer in advertising and therefore uh, I spent my life then on, uh, in uh, Kingston on Thames, the outskirts of London. And so I was uh, travelling in and out to London. I got very familiar with London. And uh, that was, uh, that was a, a second home to me. In fact, I consider myself that I've had three different homes. All of them have been very well placed and all of them I've enjoyed every one. My first was when I was a child in, in up going up to the war in Lancashire and learning all I did learn there. From then after the war, it was essential that I had to go where the, my type of work was necessary or, or better to do, and that was London. And then from London, I came to the Isle of Man and I've been here ever since. So it's three distinct journeys in my life. And we're here today in your lovely home, overlooking uh, the beautiful sea and skies. It started raining a little bit now, but uh, at Port Erin here on the Isle of Man, when you reflect on all that you went through 80 years ago, what are your thoughts about what you went through at that time as you look back? Well, the, the th uh, what, to, thinking back about some of the things that happened, you always go back, uh, or at least I do anyway, uh, to both the very good uh, incidents and the very bad ones. And the bad ones are, are easy to remember, or so are the good ones. And the, the ones in Burma, there were three or four occasions in Burma when, uh, you know, it was really, uh, we were in a really serious situation. And I, I often, or on the, these three occasions, I remember distinctly what they were. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to get out of this. And as you look back now, do you consider the effort that, and that the, the the cost in in your in lives and everything else to be worthwhile? You look back all these eighty well, years. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm a, I've had been lucky, you see. So many people. I mean, I could just have easily easily died. <laughs> I didn't didn't want to think about that. But of course, so many people that I know in Burma that that uh, never survived, and they, you know that. They were all part of the situation that has improved or tried to improve the world as it was at that time. And just a last question for you, James. If you tomorrow were to walk out into Port Erin, go for a walk, and I know you're keen on walking still, and you bumped into the 18-year-old version of yourself, what, what would you say to him? What advice would you give 18-year-old James? I'd say do it all again exactly as you do, because... <coughs> So many things I've tried to uh, look after myself, and I think that that's the main thing, both uh, food-wise, occupation, and although I must say that this is going to be interesting, and it's in my book as well, because I started smoking at a very early age, long before I left uh, secondary school. I think I would must have been. 12 or so and it was a friend it's always the situation a friend he's smoke he's older than me he started smoking giving me cigarettes so that was the beginning and then uh, it got up until the uh, after the war i was smoking through the sm smoking through the war and we were getting issued with free cigarettes in india and uh, I realised, I think, well, this is not... Everyone else then was saying, oh, you shouldn't smoke, or, or they were saying that, even though there were so many smokers about. So I thought, no, I'll try to give up. I, mean, I think I made a couple of attempts before I finally did and uh, never looked back on that side of it, really. And food as well. I've always been careful to, to try and eat the right things. And... Uh, 
I think, you know, look after myself in that way. James, it's been an absolute pleasure and a real honour to meet you. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice meeting you. Thank <laughs> you.